So yeah, thanks for having me guys, much appreciated. I'll keep it brief. I know everyone's uh, <laughs> sick of online meetings and stuff like that, but I just thought I'd touch on a few of the safety areas and, and try and put it more of a sailor's perspective on, on what you might've seen before. So um, the main thing from our point of view is, is you've got to you know, carry the, the key safety gear, which, which is already part of your auditing process anyway. Um, just, just one of the key things there on fire extinguishers that we notice a lot is that if people um, use fire extinguishers as a regular shake, do you know what I mean? To make sure that all the sediment's not in the bottom, that they're actually going to work when they, um, when, when you want them to work. So a regular shake of those, it, it doesn't happen that much in yachts. People think you've just got to get a new one and be compliant, but unless you shake them regularly, and turn them upside down and give them a bit of a decent shake that they, they won't work when they're required to be. So that's just one little thing from there. Um, I'll talk a little bit about flares. I know people are always asking about flare collections and stuff like that. I've got a little bit of information at the end I'll share with you from there. Um, and the only other one, um, just a little bit on EPIRBs, making sure that um, you, uh, th there's no confusion about that. If you're carrying your own PLB, um, and I'm not necessarily a fan of, the, of this legislation ourselves, it doesn't count as your boat EPIRB. So your boat EPIRB is separate. The only thing difference in those two is, is the battery life. There's no difference in the signal whatsoever. So just be sure that if you're doing an offshore race and you've got you know, personal EPIRBs on, they don't substitute for your boat EPIRB as part of our regulations. In Queensland, they do, which is a weird sort of thing from my point of view. Um, so just keep that in mind. And the only other thing that I see a lot on yachts and all that is, is the EPIRBs are normally positioned somewhere way down below, which are quite hard to access. In an emergency, you want to be able to grab that EPIRB as your most valuable piece of equipment. And if you have to get off the boat with a fire or something like that, you want to be able to grab it and, and have it accessible. Most people put them way down the bottom of the stairs or, or somewhere distant in their boat. And uh, if you, especially if you've got a fire, you're not going to be able to get to it to, to get off the boat. So just keep that in mind as well. So I'll, I'll move along. Um, I, I just uh, I discussed with you before about open waters. I put this in there. So maritime from our definition makes open waters and you're there from, uh, from Bower and Joey across to Box Head. And you guys, uh, in speaking with Brendan, all the racing stuff and all that that you guys done, I don't really need to deal with that. But from our point of view, from a maritime point of view, and it's not my home turf, but I was talking to our boating safety guys today. I draw that line across there, if you can see my cursor, um, across to uh, Boxhead from, from Baron Joey Lighthouse there. So just keep that in mind. Um, with life jackets, the only thing that... Um, is I just want to point out there is, is most sailing regulations for category, you know, four and above need a 150. For, for us, one of the things we see all the time is with kids' life jackets. So that the, the ones that are circled now are kids' life jackets. They're only 50 Newton. So if you were to go around the corner, recreational sailing or whatever, and you turned and you went out past that um, into, into open waters from enclosed waters, Technically, those kids' life jackets are, are, are not legal. So people go, if, if the families are dinghy sailors and whatever else, they'll go out and buy a dinghy jacket, um, but they actually are, are non-compliant. They've actually, it seems silly, but you've got to actually go and buy a foam jacket, which is similar to, to this one uh, in the middle here. If you can see my cursor, I'm not sure if you can see that. And just up the top there, 150 Newton, which is, we only need 100 in maritime circles to go offshore. Uh, it's a 150 for category one to four in, in yachting circles, as, as you're probably all aware. So just the types of life jackets, there's these, um, it's not really applicable to you guys, but I just thought I'd run through these bum bag types, which I absolutely hate. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of those at all. Of just a standard jacket you'd use for fishing or whatever else. And then the more India specific sailing jackets, that's a 165 crew saver. And then you can go right up to, I think that's a 260 or 270 Newton life jacket. What I was trying to, what I was trying to emphasize there is, is that if you've got um, a boat and, and the, the club regulations are that you can self-service your life jackets, it's a good idea to think about a mid-range one that you can self-service. 
if you can't self-service, you, you're actually having to come up with a quite a considerable amount of money each year, especially a complicated jacket like this one here. The very last one you can see is that jacket might cost you 70 or $80 to service each year. So, and if you've got a swag of those, 10 of those on your boat, you're going to be up for a fair sum. If the club, Sailing Australia says that you, you can service them yourself. If the club endorses that, some clubs don't. Um, if the club endorses that, you should be trying to think about jackets that are medium priced around that sort of under $200 mark. They're still good jackets, as long as they've got the safety harness clips and stuff like them on them. They're actually, you know, a, a good jacket. You don't need to go and spend unless you're doing a, you know, round the world voyage or something like that. So just keep that in mind. So we've got a standard um, standard mechanism for the life jackets. Is, uh, these breakaway clip ones here that I'm showing the green are, are probably a little bit outdated now. That's a manual jacket. Then we've got an auto inflate jacket there with the uh, inflation mechanism here, the black one. Just remember those, the only thing that can inspire on a life jacket, expire, is the, is the auto inflate mechanism. They've got a three year shelf life and it's like buying flares. If you go and get a new part for those, make sure you look at the date on those before you buy it to make sure you've still got close to three years on it. Don't buy it, you know, if you've only got one year of life left or if it's on special, you can guarantee that it that it uh, it's, it's about to expire or similar to the flares. And and there's the um, the hammer mechanism, which is a hydrostatic release for, for releasing the life jackets. So what, there's mixed camps. I've been to, a, you know, a few sea survival courses over the years and all that. And, and there seems to be a pretty thick line drawn in the sand about which sort of jacket that, that, that people prefer. Some people are, are in the auto manual camp, but auto camp, auto inflate camp, and some are in the manual camp. What I thought I'd do is I, I gave a talk at um, uh, Lake Macquarie Yacht Club to their cruising division, and they wanted stuff specific on life jackets. In the same time, I, I, was, I came across two, two good bits of information, which I found were, were really interesting in terms of that. So the first one here is just a podcast, which some of you might have heard, Will Oxley in the 1998 Hobart, and he talks clearly about um, what his choice of jacket is, is, manual, is, is a manual jacket over an auto inflate for a key reason. I'll just, I'll just play it for you. I'll just duck ahead. So what he talks about is, I'll bring you in on the story so you don't have to listen, but the, the boat's already capsized once and, and, the, and the boat's upside down and they've just come up from that there and he'll talk you through it uh, from there. It'll only take about a minute if I get the timing right. So, so what he goes through is the boat comes upright. One of the guys was pinned under the boat for about, for about five minutes. He must have been able to hold his breath for a while. It was, he was on B-52, which... Which, which did a full um, you know, 360 degree turn. And um, it, he, he expounds the, the values of a, of a manual life jacket where the guy was able to unclip himself from the boat and swim away and makes a clear definition between if he would have had an auto inflate jacket on, it would have pinned him against the boat and there would have been no way he probably he could have swam out from there. As opposed to about the same, I listened to that podcast during the week and this happened on Lake Macquarie uh, in, in my home territory here uh, on the same weekend, actually, where a guy was with his wife on the lake, um, just two of them out recreational sailing. Uh, he got knocked on the head by the boom and knocked into the water. He had a life jacket on, but a manual jacket. And, um, and he, he passed, he, he died um, because his wife couldn't turn the boat around and get back to him. So, the contrast is, you know, and I've changed my thinking a little bit. I was always in the auto camp in, in a big way. Do you know what I mean? My personal choice, uh, you know, would be if I'm clipped on, um, clipped on the boat on uh, in any way, I, 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 the manual would be my preference. But if I'm recreational sailing, cruising or anything like that, and I'm not clipped on, the, the automatic jacket would be my preference. So just, just, just take that into account. I, I'm not actually saying one's right or one's wrong but I've, I've heard this debate in sailing circles especially with the auto inflate about getting out of the cabin if you get trapped in the cabin um you know the auto inflate could could pin you in the cabin and things like that so just uh 
I thought it was a reasonable exercise to go through. And when we were face to face late Macquarie, we had a debate about it for quite a while and actually it was quite a reasonable debate. So I'll keep that in mind. So with the servicing of life jackets, I won't take too long on this. Where we're heading with the servicing of life jacket in maritime is, is, is we, we've run community servicing uh, over the last couple of years and the numbers are starting to drop off on that. I'm also Brendan and Nick, and if you guys want a service clinic, we can come and deliver one at your club uh, and explain it face to face with people. But the, the key to it is, is, and it's a little bit vague, this bit here about manufacturer's instructions, just be really careful when you buy a life jacket that, that, it, that it can be self-serviced if, if that's the one you're after. As more complicated jackets, you can't self-service. Um, and then um, I've got some links there on a page at the end to take you to, to the servicing of it specifically. The key things are, especially in the saltwater environment, are the cylinder, which has just popped up here. Uh, and, and get this straight, if your cylinder is, is still weighs, it's within two grams of the stamp weight on it, is you don't need to get a new cylinder. A lot of people think a service is automatically getting a new cylinder. If your cylinder is fine and, and, it, and it hits the right checks, you can keep using your cylinder. In some of the freshwater environments, we see people who have had the same cylinder for 10 years. Um, so it's, it's just the corrosion that's the issue with that. Um, and then the only other thing is if you do self-service, our proof is you've got to actually record it on the jacket. That's the key thing as well there. But some jackets have got a panel similar to that one I'm showing you now. But the key is, is, is uh, blow it up overnight. Make sure it doesn't, it's, it's still hard and firm overnight. Um, make sure the cylinder weighs within two grams of the stamp weight and you can sign it off and make sure you've got paperwork on your jacket because there's no way if, if our guys pull you over on the water, there's no, there's no way that, that uh, they can tell whether you've serviced it or not. So I won't linger with that one. Um, just a little bit on regulations. I, I've, I've done a couple of uh, talks in Newcastle Harbour, which is a little bit different to here, but there's a decent, I hope this video, you won't be able to get the audio, but I hope this video comes up all right for you. You've probably seen this video, but I don't know why I'm playing it really, maybe just for a bit of fun, but have a look. Watch the pink spinnaker coming through here. So um, that's, uh, I suppose I'm showing you that to, to show you what, uh, what, what big ships can do, but um, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting exercise, that, that one there. there. There's a bit of a backstory on that, how much the guy got fined and he was, he was a captain in the Navy or something or other. I don't know if anyone's seen that before or knows the background to it, but anyway. Um, just remember on the water, we've got to follow, a lot of people forget that that the waterway is not exclusively ours and, and we've got to follow the racing rules of sailing plus the collision regulations. So we're dealing with two things. A lot of sailors um, get, I think they've got exclusive use of the waterways and, and it always poses a problem uh, in, in, in that realm. So the, the coal regs, it, you know, it talks about there, it, it's, it's on any waterway, any navigable waterways from inland to high seas and it's global. So we've got to stick to those uh, collision regulations as part of our, our day out on the water. It's, it's, it's as important as, as the racing rules of sailing. So the other thing that's important then is, and, and, and it, I'm involved in a boat with 10, with, uh, 10 shareholders and uh, maybe it's not a problem for so much, but what I find is in, in, if you end up in the, in the coroner's court, um, someone's gonna get 
the finger pointed at them and that comes back to the maritime regulations and I think you need to establish in, in the very in first instant that who's actually in charge. We use the term skipper in sailing most of the time. Um, in, in maritime circles, I, I like the term master in charge of the vessel, which means anyone who's, um, uh, they don't have to be steering the boat. Skipper in, uh, tends to uh, infer that that person's steering the boat. So master in charge of the vessel is the person who's actually in charge of it. If you look at the maritime regulations, this is not a bad little checklist. That master in charge is making sure that the uh, the, the term ship's used there, but the boat is, the, the yacht is safe, the yacht is properly equipped, the yacht is properly crewed and properly operated. If you had uh, someone rock up to your boat as a guest skipper or whatever, you've got to really then make sure, um, you know, that it's clear in everyone's mind who's actually the master in charge of the vessel. I, I think sometimes, you know, it's, it's um, a hot shot turns up, starts calling the shots, are they actually in charge? You know, if we, if we had an incident or whatever, what would actually happen in that situation if, 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 if there was a serious incident occur. I, th I like the maritime definition of master in charge as opposed to skipper in some ways of clarifying that up. So just remember, um, you know, if, if we get in a situation where we're in, where we're in the right and a collision is gonna happen, that it, it, you can still be held liable even if you're in the right, if you don't take action to avoid a collision. So you must take, a tr must take appropriate action Sorry, you must avoid the collision. You must take action, and and if a collision takes place, both skippers can be held responsible. So that's not that's not within your racing rules so much, but outside that, if you collide with a with a cruising boat on a, on a, on a racing day, so just keep all that in mind. Um, sometimes we get a bit of uh, I've done a couple of these at yacht clubs, and we get a bit of conjecture about what's actually a sailing boat. Um, wild oats there, as you can see, carries a motor but it, it, it would still be defined as a sailing boat. So what is a sailing vessel is an interesting definition. Um, this boat here in the photo is, is obviously motor sailing, a um, couple of bed sheets up there and the motor looks like it's on full bore. But the term, it means any vessel under sail provided the propelling machinery is not fitted, is not being used. So your motor can obviously be running in neutral. As soon as you engage that in gear, you become a motor vessel. Okay, so as soon as the propelling mechanism is engaged, is, is the definition, is engaged, is then you become a motorboat. So you've got to get, you've got to get used to that, that when you become a motorboat, the rules change straight away. So um, the other thing that we're going to implement at uh, Royal Prince Alfred now is that once you're motoring to the start or the finish, that you've got to have one of these, uh, one of these upside down cones there because I think I've been around boats for a long time and I don't remember seeing too many boats when they're under motor who actually carry that. That's, that's a motor sailing symbol that you're meant to fly. I've never seen, I may have seen it a couple of times. I don't think people might be able to uh, give me some idea of that, whether they've ever seen it. So once you're a power boat, and I, th I found a photo of one of my least favorite boats. I hope I'm not upsetting one. One of these McGregor style trailer, trailable boats that are trying to be a sailing boat. And they've got a big about a hundred horsepower outboard on the back and they just, they're the ugliest boat I've ever seen. They go along at about 25 knots under motor. And I wouldn't call them a sailing boat in any way, shape or form. I hope the manufacturer of McGregor is not in the audience, but uh, so, just remember, there's a couple of rules that when you become a power boat, a power boat, uh, bow riding, we call it's it's funny. The definition of bow riding is is the one here that the, who extends any part of their body outside the perimeter of the vessel. So things we'd normally do in sailing are, are really uh, technically illegal. So you see Ichiban here with everyone uh, over the side, and that bow riding. The term is bow riding, but it actually can happen anywhere around the boat. Some of the ski people who hang over the back can technically be booked for bow riding. So just remember that one. The, the other one, this is probably more important is, is that in this situation in the sailing boat, we'd be talking about luffing rights and the yellow boat having right away, being able to push the other one up and whatever. But in the power boat situation, it's actually got to give way. So we've got to give way to the boat on your right or on your starboard when you're under motor. So just remember that even if you've got your sails up and you're technically a motorboat, that, that that's that's something that you've got to think about.
think about some other things regulations with if you, if you if you've got a canoes or kayaks in the water that there's no ab absolute definition on this one in terms of the regulations but it's recommended that we that, that power uh, and sailboats give way to to paddle craft and rowing vessels okay so that that one's hard to get a, a, a an absolute definition on who's got right away there um the thing about fishing boats and and boats that are uh, you know recreational fishing boats that are moored a, a boat like that under anchor is technically uh, not not underway because there's an anchor there. Once they're underway, then the whole argument changes. So it's underway if it's not aground, it's not at anchor. If it's been if it's not made fast to a dock, the shore, or other stationary. So if you're drifting, if that boat like this next photo. This is the silly thing about that. Technically, that boat's underway, and the one before is 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 not underway. So that's the definition. Once you're anchored, it changes. Okay, so that's the that 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 kid there fishing in that tinny is underway. All right. And the only other one you've got to take into account if in towing situations is is vessels that are restricted in their ability to manoeuvre. So a vessel engaged in a towing exercise. But this is more commercial definition, but it could be applied to um, to someone being towed as well. Um, we've got to give way to vessels that are restricted in their manoeuvre. It's, it's probably more of a big ships thing, but uh, you've got to keep in mind that that, that that could apply to someone towing another boat up pit water. So just keep that in mind as well. Sound signals for big stuff. The one that we get in Newcastle Harbour and I have the club record for the five short blasts, which is uh, five short blasts, 30 seconds later, another five short blasts. It rocks the whole town and everyone knows that there's some trouble. It, it really means, it really means signal your intentions and the only other one we get up here. But just just be mindful of that in, in the shipping world that um, that they, they do in the commercial world, they do stick by that type of stuff. Um, there's other ones for overtaking and stuff, which you don't hear that often, but if you're up around Newcastle Way or whatever, those five short blasts, which um, rocks the whole town and lets you know that, uh, lets everyone know that something's happening on the harbour means really get out of my way, okay? The only other one that's interesting if you're out to sea, and, it, and, it's, and it's happened a lot over the last few years, if you are going up the coast, a lot of the big ships now that are off Newcastle, they're actually drifting. The one, if you're north of Newcastle Harbour, the, any ship that's out there that may look like it's anchored is actually drifting. They come down with the southerly current and it's much cheaper for them to drift. And what they do is one of the ship's captain pilots was telling me they actually put up the vessel not under command signal, which is not, which is not uh, legally true they, to, to try and get themselves out of trouble. So if you think you're seeing a ship there and you're not sure what it's doing it, it, and it's got those symbols up, it, it actually is a vessel not under command, whether it's legally or not. So keep that in mind. And the only other one we get up there is, is again, that the big ships one is restricted in their ability to manoeuvre. So it's a diamond like that. The one on Newcastle is the, bird, the one we use is the dredge, which uh, regularly comes in and out. And that's, that's the symbol for um, uh, restricting their ability to manoeuvre and then the uh, the passing side's always the diamond side. If you see a dredge or anything like that, the passing side's the diamonds or a girl's best friend is the way to think of that. So uh, that's the way we go. The fishing boats are an interesting one. They're very non-compliant. If you ever come at this, I know there's not too many fishing boats down your way, but they're meant to carry that uh, that symbol up the top two cones uh, apex together. Uh, don't see that very often. And you've only got to give way to a fishing boat technically when they're fishing. Green over white fishing at night is the symbol to say they're fishing. Okay, so just keep that in mind if you if, if you're out to sea in a, in a fishing boat. Um, and this is the only time in, in the overtaking world that um, that a sailing boat actually has to give way to a power boat is when you're overtaking. And the the thing to remember there is you're overtaking if you're coming at the same beam as the white light you'd have off your navigation light, which is 112 degrees off off your quarter on either side. So technically, if you're approaching from there, you're overtaking. So if you're doing it at night, if you can see their stern light, you're still overtaking. Once you move to the side over here to the port or starboard, you go outside those arcs and you're and you technically not overtaken, becomes a give way type thing in that situation. 
So the only other things that were worth um, some of the things we come across around your marinas and all that sort of stuff are reducing the wash, the, the different speed um, uh, knots. We, you can have them up to 15 knots, which you don't see that often. There's, there's some areas of Sydney Harbour where that happens. Um, cardinal marks, just remember the cardinal ones can get confusing, is that if, if it's an east cardinal, the, the clear water's on the eastern side and the lights are the only other thing that's a little bit confusing with the cardinals. The south has, has, has six flashes and one long flash. You see down the bottom there. And the long flash is to distinguish between uh, the, the west and the, and the south. So it's six flashes, then nine, and then continuous flashing in the north. So if you go to Sydney Harbour around Sow and Pigs Reef there, you see that in full, full display. If you're sailing there at night, with the background of the of the city and everything else it's uh definitely a light show that goes on there um whether we won't talk about whether it will be here forever the only other one i wanted to sort of finish on was alcohol and boating um being that you know the the mentality and and i've done enough of it myself and um you know in terms of twilight sailing a few beers and stuff like that um, I just wanted to point out that the guy drinking the beer there with this arrow has actually got his, till, his hand on the tiller. So technically, he's the bloke under control and, uh, and, and he's the one who's obviously uh, do, looks like he's doing the most drinking. So it, it, it comes back in my mind, drive anyone steering or exercise control of the vessel's course or direction. So if someone's drinking and a, kid's, and a, and a kid was steering, say, and it said, well, you know, he's the one steering, I can drink. It's actually exercising control over the vessel's course or direction. If they're doing it under someone else's direction, then it, I don't think it'll really wash in the coroner's court. You know, and as a skipper, you, you, you can't let anyone else drive. If you're the, and if you go back to that master in charge, if you're the master in charge of the vessel, that all needs to hold up, do you know what I mean? And I don't think it would, I think the master in charge would have to be the person who, if everyone else was having a few beers, that it would have to be the one who was, uh, who was, um, you know, under under 0.05. So just just keep all that in mind when you when you're out there, especially in the twilights. I know I know the uh, the mentality of having a few beers after work and stuff like that, but uh, no dramas. Yeah. Um, what I'll do is. Um, I'll leave you to get back to your stuff is I've, I've got a little um, handout that I've done up for um, uh, Brendan who can Brendan or Nick can circulate it's got a link on that to, to where how we do all the flare collections where our life jacket service clinks are you can click on this QR code here to get to download our handbook and there's also some stuff there on um, uh, flares life jacket servicing regulations QR um, there was, there was a couple of other bits of information I've, I've put on there. My details, if you needed to, to send me an email to clarify any, any details or anything like that. So I won't hold you up any longer. Uh, please get back to me or if there's any, uh, I don't know how questions go over Zoom, but if, if you've got any queries or you need to clarify anything to do with that, just my, my details will be on the sheet that um, give me a ring or, or email me. And I'm happy to answer any queries. And uh, if I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll find out for you. So, um, uh, so we've got no no issues with that. The only other one that that I actually just forgot the slide there was with um, tenders. You guys have to row out to your boat. Just remember, a tender um, is only a tender when you're in enclosed waters, and and you can only get away with the limited safety gear. I just clarified that today with our legal girl. Once you go offshore, so if you went to Broughton Island um, and you had your tender there, you've got to carry the safety gear as if it's a power boat in your tender is the only other one that people get confused with. I've done a bit, few talks at a few cruising, um, cruising divisions of clubs and that question's come up a bit. So if you go offshore, once you go out to sea, that tender has to have the safety gear of a normal power boat. So. Just remember that as well. So yeah. All right, guys, I'll leave you to it. Um, I don't know how questions go or whatever, whether we deal with that separately or or whatever. So thanks for having me. Much appreciated. And um, stay safe in COVID times, everyone. Let's hope we can Thank get you back very much, out. John. Great uh, kick off now, Steve, with a, a little bit more about the uh, um, the regulations and how how they apply at times and 
and um, and then a little bit about auditing. Thank you very much. Have you got my screen now? I have. Right, yeah. Welcome everybody. Hello. Um, Steve Hatch is my name. There's what I do. Uh, I mean, you've seen this before. Apart from being an international judge and umpire, I get involved with, in, but with insurance companies, the police, the coroners that our last speaker was talking about, providing advice to major yacht clubs, Australian sailing and to um, world sailing. I'm on the case book committee that makes the um, precedents and writes those up. Um, and um, it was right in the last talk that, um, you know, when you go to the coroner's court, and I've been to half a dozen working for coroners, they want to go after anybody that's got any money. And um, so they can get evidence to use in um, later cases. So um, take care. So the international rules for prevention of collisions at sea, um, you can buy the actual book if you like from boat books. You can, um, and the special regulations for the auditing, you can just download from um, Australian Sailing's um, website and um, have yourself a copy of that. The special regulations are designed to make us safe when we go to sea and um, or out on the water and provide a minimum equipment, accommodation and training standards for racing boats. And they complement the racing rules of sailing, the collision regulations and um, our sailing instructions and notices of race as the rules that govern us um, for sailing. The equipment, as in the Telstra ad, you don't need them until you do. And um, when you're getting ready for the season and you're checking your gear, make sure it's in date. The last thing we like as auditors is to turn up and find that, you know, half the stuff you've put out is out of date. Think when you're looking at the gear and inspecting it for yourself, would you risk your life on it? You might have to. And, um, and sometimes people need special gear. So we're just talking about the life jackets. We find all the big canting keel boats now have both manual and automatic jackets. And I mean, where the um, the manual jackets when there were downstairs because of um, after the Rambler incident where the keel fell off in the middle of the night and everybody was stuck on board and having to ditch their life jackets. Obviously, some people hire their gear for the EPIRBs and the life rafts, um, but you need to get those inspected and that sort of stuff when you um, want to do one of the big races. Be prepared for your equipment audit. Get all the stuff out. I mean, the last thing we want to do is to have to sit there and wait while you dig around in cupboards, trying to find the stuff that you don't know where it is. And um, I can see Frank sitting there and various people, you know, the last thing we want to do is um, go and, um, have to wait while you find it. Set it out, put it up in the cockpit so that we can quickly pick it up and go, yep, yeah, that's fine, tick that off the list. This year with the audit exemption, you're still gonna have to lodge your, your form. You're still gonna have to do your checks, make sure the stuff's in date and lodge your form with the sailing office, even though you won't immediately get an auditor to come and inspect your boat. But that's exactly what happens in Victoria anyway, so most of the time. Storm sails. This was a picture I took at the start of a coughs race. This storm sail doesn't meet the rules. If the boat, like this boat, is pre-July 2005, 
it's got to have 20% of the area in the upper half. This is not in the upper half and it's definitely not 20% of the area on that jig. Um, our friend from Maritime talked about life jackets. So you still need to get your life jackets inspected and um, get your certificate for that. So that's a bit about, you know, a quick bit on the um, audits. Andrew will talk to you more at the end about what he's expecting. And, um, and now I'll do a bit on the collision regulations and how they relate to sailing. Now, quite a bit of that's already been gone, including some of my images that um, have already been shown. I don't know whether this is love, but, you know, they've got quite intimate. Uh, and um, our friend in the UK with his pink spinning about to lose his rig. Uh, he thinks he's on starboard, I think, you know. Um, the collision regulations um, are governed through the maritime um, regulations, which says they apply to lakes, rivers, inland waterways, as amended by the, um, the safety regulations. Um, and in a lot of states in Australia, if you go and sail in a lot of other states, the collision regulations apply even when the um, racing rules apply between boats that are racing. But that's not the case in New South Wales. And here's an example, a couple of power boats um, going along. In New South Wales, we have a special rule. Rule um, one, of the international regulations is modified to say that the coal rigs do not apply to vessels taking part in aquatic activities if the aquatic license that authorised them provides for a different set of rules. So that's what applies to us. I mean, I've been in plenty of court cases as an expert witness um, with Ed Cox and a few other barristers around the place where the other side's been trying to argue that just toss the racing rules out the window. The collision regulations are what's going to be used in this court case. And, you know, the judge says, you know, haven't you read, you know, Steve Hatch's um, submission? And I've checked up on that and that's right. So forget about the coal regs. These were two racing yachts that had a collision. The coal regs come in five parts, the general, the steering and sailing rules, that's the important part for us. Um, and then there's lights and shapes, sounds and light signals, and some exemptions. The Australian Transport Safety Bureau has over the years investigated an awful lot of um, accidents between um, vessels. And they say that the most common contributing factors are the failure to maintain a proper lookout the lack of visibility for small vessels, skippers doing erratic and unpredictable manoeuvres, anchoring or drifting in busy traffic areas, particularly people fishing at night with a lack of lights, as we saw a few years back with somebody, a couple of people killed under the Harbour Bridge where they were in a tinny with no lights in the middle at 2 a.m. in the morning, um, or lights on board the boat that block out the nav lights, as is another um, factor. So the key coal regs are five, you've got to keep a proper lookout. If you have an accident and you finish up in a court, I mean, I was um, advising on one a couple of years ago, a powerboat accident in Victoria, where a um, half cabin, um, sort of 30 foot boat ran over the back of a ski boat. And the, when we were looking at apportioning the liability, one side was arguing the um, ski boat that there was 100% in the other boat. And I said, it can't be because you failed the basic test of not keeping a proper lookout. We probably have to attribute sort of 20% of the liability to you. Um, and 80% to the other side. 
in this in this collision, two people were put in wheelchairs and one was killed. And um, so you got to keep a proper lookout, and that includes behind you. I'm amazed how many people make a turn or tack their boat and they don't look behind them. You've got to keep a safe speed, speaks for itself. You've got to avoid the risks of collision. And you've got to take action under eight to avoid a collision. And that means you act early and decisively. You don't make a two degree of course and think I'll get closer, I'll get a bit closer. No, it's make a 40 degrees change of course, you know, when you're 100 metres away. When you're in narrow channels, like out the side front of the yacht club, you've got to stick on the right. And traffic separation schemes, we'll talk a bit more about those again later as well as we'll go through these. So a proper lookout. You've got to think about your boat with your spinnaker up, your boom out, the red zone. You probably have very little vision at all. The pink zone, you've got restricted visibility. That means you've got to take extra care when you round a mark, put up your spinnaker, is a critical time for keeping um, a lookout because everybody's busy with the spinnaker and you need to um, be alert. We get yachts run down by ferries. Didn't you see them coming? Didn't you have eight people on board? And here was the result being towed home. At first 40 destroyed. When you're in a um, channel, you stick to the, um, the right. The rules move on, 12 sailing vessels. It's just like in the, it's just like in the race rules. Port gives way to starboard and windward gives way to lured. Overtaking, the boat that's overtaking always keeps clear, whether that's a sailing boat or a power boat. That's the only time the power doesn't um, have to give way to sailing. Head on situations between two power boats, then if you can see the, um, the head on situation at night, if you can see both the red and the green lights, you need to change your course to starboard and the other guy should do the same. Power boats, if you're in a crossing situation, you give way to the right. And um, so there's a sailing, just like the starboard tacker. The overtaking has got to go round. The head on boats, you both turn to starboard and you'll be safe. Power crossing, you slow down, you wait for them to go past, give way to the right. Give way to start. Rule 18 is, as our friend from Maritime highlighted, is a hierarchical rule. So power vessels, you firstly give way to vessels not under command. Then the next is ones that are restricted in their maneuverability, ones engaged in fishing and sailing vessels if you're a power boat. If you're a sailing vessel, vessels not under command, vessels restricted in their maneuverability and um, fishing boats, as long as they're fishing. So the power boat should go behind. Now, do the power boats go behind? I was sailing along at a race in the winter series and my um, 
crew standing up on the boom watching the breeze and saying, sail lower, sail lower, Steve. And I start going up. He says, I need you to go down. I said, sorry, can't. I don't know who was more surprised, him when the boom passed over the back deck of a 50-foot motor cruiser or the naked girl on the deck chair on the back of the 50-foot motor cruiser as the boom passed over the top of them. Um, but there's always some idiot out there that um, doesn't have a clue about the rules, but has a big boat. Sailing vessels and a ship. Yeah, don't be the pink guy with the spinnaker. Um, go around. Nav lights, as we said, as uh, our maritime friend, if you can see the stern light and you're coming from behind, so you'll be coming from behind, you're overtaking, and then you've got your port and starboard lights. This ship has no idea there's a skiff even there. It's a bit like the ad on TV for the truck drivers and the people say, no, no, there's no motorbikes out there. Um, this ship will have no idea that person's even there. And um, in Sydney Harbour, you're, you mean you're lucky up in Pittwater, but when you go and sail down in Sydney Harbour in the Sydney Harbour Regatta or whatever, where you get the ferries with the orange diamonds and um, it gives a priority over sail. And, um, and if you can't comply because there's no wind and you don't have an engine or whatever, you need to make it clearly obvious as early as possible that you... Um, are not in a position to um, comply. Um, there's been plenty of boats run down by ferries. Um, my good friends, the McGee brothers from the US in an 18 foot skiff, and my best friend, John Ferguson, when he was sailing with Ian Ford in a star in 82 was killed, um, being hit by a ferry. So, this rule is a diamond rule, it's a shape, and shapes apply during the day. This is a daylight rule, sunset to sunrise, sunrise to sunset. And um, traffic um, separation is a, um, an issue at Sydney Harbour, Botany Bay, lots of ports up and down the Queensland coast. And um, we had a case in a, a um, Flinders Island race, the CYC versus Black Sheep. And this um, Grasmi Mesra um, was leaving Botany Bay and the harbour master of Botany Bay radioed Black Sheep and said, you won't be able to see this ship, but it's, um, it's on its way out of port. Please alter course and head for the south head at um, Botany Bay. That was ignored. The ship came out through the heads. He was radioed again, he ignored that. He got within about 100 metres of the side of the ship and then decided he would bear away down it. Um, this is what it looks like on the, the chart. And the ship finished up. I mean, this is the outgoing channel. They've got to stay south of this central passage. And he was, he, the, the pilot drove it so that it was 0.09 of a nautical mile on the, the wrong side of the channel. And we disqualified him, appealed, and he lost. It's a lot easier now under the current, under the new rule book, because the new rule book has appendix TS, and it says if an official complaint or action is lodged against a boat by a commercial government or naval driven power vessel, by a pilot, a vessel traffic scheme or vessel traffic service, which is what Botany Bay and Sydney Harbour are, um, or by any other local government authority, it shall be presumed the boat broke the rule. 56.2. And um, so we now have a rule 
um, for um, right yeah that's mine Nick thank you very much Steve that was excellent that was uh, very helpful we've just got one um, question just asking if you can share the link to download the coal reg but I'm sure we can find that and pass them on yeah um, I think um, I think you covered the bit that um, Andrew and I wished to cover about audits, which was just that we'd like to continue um, receiving the forms into the office. And it's a great way of everyone checking that they still have all the equipment on board and that it's all in good condition and, and appropriately dated in date. So I think that was all we actually um, we're going to cover on that side. So thank you very much. Oh, yeah. OK, I'm just going to now very quickly um, just cover the um, Royal Prince Alfred sort of incident response and a bit about uh, emergency procedures. So I'm going to try and share my screen now and see if I can make my presentation work. Yes, okay. Um, so uh, all I'm gonna talk about now is very quickly about our incident response. And um, I suppose the most important thing regarding an incident is um, any emergency service or anyone that you're calling to assist you in the event of an emergency, an accident, or the need of assistance, um, is that, that you on board and the people involved in the incident are the people that know most about what's going on. So it's vitally important that when communicating, particularly with emergency services, with an ambulance, um, with anyone who's actually assisting you, that you're, you're doing that directly wherever possible. So um, we, we've had plenty of incidents where we've been asked to call ambulances and things. And the first thing we're asked is a, is a whole list of questions about the incident, about the injury, the, the medical condition. And as a, as a sort of intermediary in the, in the equation, that proves incredibly difficult for us. Um, so, OK, so incident and response. Um, first of all, we have to work out what is the nature of the incident and what assistance we require. Um, mod a moderate or major emergency, the first place to call is triple zero um, and actually get that side of the, um, the assistance going. That's, that's the primary concern. Get the people that can, do, can, can really help you involved and ready to assist. Um, Secondly, obviously you can advise the race officer. They may well be able to assist um, uh, with some, some level of support from the boat and at least know what's going on so they're not, they're not looking for you or waiting for you later in the day. Um, if you're not calling triple zero and you're going to use your VHF, then there are uh, two ways of doing that. One is a, a May Day and the other is a Pan Pan. A May Day is imminent danger to life. So that is, if you need someone to come as rapidly as they possibly can, then May Day is the, is the call that you would make over the radio. Pan Pan is if you need urgent assistance. So you do need assistance, but you are coping at, this, at the present time. So, um, you, it, and if, if the situation, you think it's all under control and you've issued a pan pan from your boat, um, it starts getting worse. The scenario, the person deteriorates. That's when you can actually upgrade the mayday, upgrade the pan pan to a mayday and get that help as quickly as you can. Equally, the danger passes uh, or the assistance has been sought, the mayday can then be actually cancelled at the uh, over the radio so you don't have further people trying to come and, and assist. Um, obviously, the more information you, you have and you can give, the easier it is for uh, 
people to respond to your uh, to your emergency and to your requirements. And then once you're in a situation where you can, then I'd obviously advise the club. And then there are follow ups with incident reports. Um, both to the club so that we know what's happening and we keep a log of those and also to uh, RMS because they equally require reporting. Um, there is a lot of medical equipment around the club and around the committee boats and on the water. So we do carry first aid kits. Um, we have defibrillators, oxygen, um, life rings, tow lines, and a basic level of firefighting equipment. There is also emergency pain relief. Um, and many we know of your sailors, crew, skippers are first aid trained. Equally many of the, uh, the staff around the club are also medically trained. Um, we have a sticker which forms part of our special regulation requirements at the Royal Prince Alfred Yacht Club. That has now actually been updated. So I know lots of you have old and faded and, and peeling ones on your boat. So when we can get back um, and doing our special regulations checks, come and collect a new um, sticker. And uh, yeah, we'll be very pleased to give those out. It's a great way to identify the points for um, pickup on uh, the emergency points for a rapid pickup when you come ashore and it has all the details of each of the pickups and the cross streets and all the information you need to give to the emergency services um, when you have a, an incident on the water. Um, we will obviously assist in every way, any way that we can throughout the um, throughout an incident and, and provide added support also once you get back to the club. Um, we've got a list of the actuals for us, the nearest and the best pickups for um, ambulances, Kareel Bay, the clubhouse, uh, Royal Motor Club or Church Point Wall. Um, it's a little bit of post-incident reporting, which we just like to remind everyone of, obviously inform the club of all incidents. As I said, we do keep a log. All incidents involving serious injury to a person must be reported to Maritime and they have um, online forms that you can get. All incidents involving serious injury or damage over $5,000 reported to RMS and the reporting time is 24 to 48 hours. Um, and we equally collect a copy of that because they do follow up with us. Um, we do always ask them about the $5,000 because you can easily write off a sale uh, and that would be $5,000. But they don't mean, uh, uh, they don't mind about sales. It's other accidents and, and damage that is, is to actual vessels um, uh, wise on that side. We have asked Nathan and the team. Um, follow, obviously, we always follow the directions of the RMS Boating Services as they assist um, throughout though, throughout an incident. And the there is a link there to the um, forms that are online. And I think that is pretty much um, it from the safety side for me, except that um, obviously, very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, John. And thank you for everyone to, for your time this evening. I hope um, that everyone has learnt or been reminded of a, a, a few different points. Um, and we will obviously follow this up with a bit more about the sailing and the season and hopefully what's what will shortly be a return to sailing and racing.